the, the heart of this series <clears throat> is that we believe God wants us to live our lives to the fullest. <clears throat> and that we only do that in him by understanding our identity in him. And that is exactly what we talked about last week. Is that in him is the only way we can truly be faithful and understand um, what it is his will for us is and that we can live in the most fruitful way possible. This whole series is built around this idea that God has, um, God looks at our lives maybe different than we do and that he sees our lives and he, he wants for us in areas of our lives that we maybe don't understand that our faith gets in and connects with and is, is intended to transform us in these arenas and areas of life. Last week we looked at identities. We looked at how, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> man, I am... <clears throat> all of a sudden, and how our identities are just so powerful and how they drive us in so many important ways in our lives. It's just built into who we are, how God made us. And with that, we, we looked at what, it, what it, scripture tells us our identities are without Christ or outside of Christ, and that our identities are that of dead and helpless, evil, lost, and orphaned. And then we saw the flip side, what scripture tells us about what our identity is in Christ. And that in Christ... We are justified, we are made righteous, we are pardoned. And only through faithfulness in him, of living faithfully in him, in that identity in him, can we live our lives to the fullest. This week we're examining a question that very much connects with last week. Another question that again gets to um, our hearts in a very deep and personal way, and that is the question of purpose. Even as young children, we begin to ask ourselves these questions of purpose, of what is our purpose. Uh, I don't know if you remember, think back in your memory, if I'd asked you when you were 10 what it was you wanted to be when you grew up, what was it? That question, that question of purpose, of what do I want to be, what do I want, what do I like picture this life for myself in the future, like that is a question of purpose. What do I believe my purpose is here? We all, especially as kids, have these huge aspirations, don't we? I don't know what you, what you thought of when you said that, but we have these aspirations like, I want to be the president or an astronaut or something like that, right? This, these huge aspirations often. In many ways, these questions reveal this heart that we have of, I need purpose. I need a reason for being here, and we seek after that, we're going to be spending most of our time today in Proverbs 16. If you want to turn there, we won't be there for a minute, but that's where we're going to be here in a few minutes. I, I remember growing up when I was real young, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Our family loves the Cardinals, and we'd watch baseball all the time, whether it was the Cubs or the Braves, because they were the ones on TV the most. But I knew everything about the sport. I would study. I loved like the chess game that is with baseball, really good baseball. And I just I knew that I was going to be a major league baseball player. Which I didn't even play high school ball, but that's beside the point. That's what I that's what I thought, right? As I got a little older and into high school, it shifted. I thought I was going to be an architectural engineer. See, I, I love working with space. I can see space really easily. I, I'm this kind of weird person that you can show me blueprints and mentally I can like walk around inside the building. I can just see the space. I can understand how things function really well. And I could look and say, no, that needs to be moved over here or shifted this way. And, and throughout lots of my teen years, <clears throat> I loved just buildings and how they worked. And so I thought I'd... I want to be an architectural engineer. I want to work with buildings. Unfortunately, as I approached college, I realized I'm not very good at math. That's kind of a problem if you're going to do anything called engineering. And so I said, you know what? I love music. So I'm going to be a music ed major. Teach other people to love music like I do. And I quickly, uh, you know, graduated and got into the music education realm and realized this is not for me. I realized I'm not a teacher, at least in that way, in that place, in that setting. And this <clears throat> set off for me a several-year struggle of this question of who am I? What's my purpose? Because, see, I had just invested five years of education and time and money and three years of profession into something that now I was not. And I knew I wasn't. Like, it wasn't just that I'm not today, but I will be again. It was that I knew, like, this isn't who I am. This isn't where I'm wired, how I'm fit to be. 
And I spent a good year, year and a half, two years, really, really struggling with this question of who I am. That time period for me was a very, very difficult time. I, it was depressing for me. It was a, a, just a difficult time when I realized how important purpose was because I didn't have one all of a sudden. And I felt the ripples through my life of not having purpose. Now, thankfully, God responded. And God gave me a much clearer purpose and direction than I ever could have imagined. We all need purpose. It gives us hope. It gives us value. It feels funny to say, but it gives us purpose, right? It gives us something that we're aiming at, something with confidence. And so this question of purpose is very much a personal question, meaning rooted deeply within us. What is our purpose? Last week, we looked at our identity in Christ. And this week, we look at purpose, and those two are very much tied together. If we misunderstand our identity, it's easy for us to misunderstand purpose and to misunderstand how it works and functions in our lives, much less the specifics of your or my purpose. And as we looked at, per, at identity last week, we looked at Galatians 2, a, a pretty good passage there. I want us to go back to just verse 20, because verse 20 is a very rich verse. It has some things I want us to look at again a second time through this lens today of purpose. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God, who, be, who loved me and gave himself for me. The part I want us to notice when it comes to thinking about purpose is that kind of second phrase, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Our old self has been crucified, it has died, and a new life is born in Christ. That's what baptism just reflected, right? This means that Jesus lives in you, in us. He desires to live through you. This alone gives us purpose. Understanding this identity shift changes our purpose because our identity just changed. And, and there's clearly like this purpose in this and that Christ lives in me. Should it cause us to ask this question of what then is his purpose? That we are to be his hands and feet, that the ministry he wants to accomplish, he desires to accomplish through you and I, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in him. There's these things that he has prepared beforehand, before you had any idea that as God laid out the foundations of the earth, he said, I have this thing over here, for this person who hasn't been born yet and hasn't come to know me yet, and someday these two things are going to intersect. I have these purposes, these things I have planned out, laid out beforehand for those who are walking in Christ. This means the idea that we can accept Christ and then just continue on our merry way living life however we want to doesn't work. It isn't God's picture of what it means to be faithful. It means this idea that we can just like have some statement of faith, but then live independent of him doesn't work. It isn't how he designs it to be, if he truly is in us. It isn't this thing where we can have faith and our faith and our lives just don't have to intersect. We can just say we're faithful. It's not how it works. Instead, it's quite the opposite, that when we accept Jesus, our lives are actually no longer our own. They're his, because it's he who lives through us. We are handing over our lives to him in faith to do with as he so chooses. It's kind of intimidating to think about. Until last week, if we didn't under understand our identity in Christ, this whole thing wouldn't make sense. It isn't how it fits together in our minds. And some of us last week, we got this picture of who we are in Christ, and it was sort of shocking to us. 
I'm sure a few of you maybe had to like sit back and take inventory a second time. It's like, is this really what I believe? When I, when I say I have faith in Jesus, is this really what I thought was happening or have I misunderstood who I am and what's happening in this thing we call faith? Do I even know myself if I am in Christ? Because maybe I don't know Jesus well enough to now say I know myself well, if it is he who is in me. If, if you are a disciple of Jesus, then you will know him and beginning to know him more. You will be having <clears throat> him transform your life to look more and more like his all the time. You will be following him as he seeks to work through you to, in greater and greater levels all the time. This is what it means to be in Christ. We cannot divorce our lives and our faith. The two are together. None of this is this check-in-the-box kind of faith. It is much more personal and intimate than that. For those of you who were here in the month of September, we walked through Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. We saw God's large macro picture, if you will, of what his mission, what his purpose is. And we saw that every one of us have been invited into that. And on a macro level, that certainly is what's happening. I'm not going to rehash an entire month. You can go back and listen to those messages if you need to be reminded or miss them the first time. But at the outset, in, in a very kind of over, overarching uh, way, we could say that you and I, if we are in Christ, if we are his disciples, that our purpose is his purpose, his mission. That we are to be on mission with him. Our purpose is to be used by him to reconcile all of the world from Genesis 3 till now back to him. To be making disciples so that he can bring people back to him to know him. Those are big, broad strokes, and there's a temptation that I could stop the sermon right there, right? That's our purpose. So let's just go home and do it, right? But we know that there's more detail inside it than just that. It doesn't mean that all of us should go into vocational ministry, I, by the way, just so we're clear on that. Certainly, some of us may be called to vocational ministry. You may be called and right now and you're wrestling with it. You uh, don't want to be. I've been in those shoes, by the way. But that doesn't mean we're all called to vocational ministry. But what it does mean is that every one of us are called to ministry. But God has placed the circumstances of our lives such and that he is asking you to do ministry exactly where you're at with the people who he's placed around you in the situation, whether it's a workplace or the social settings, whatever it may be, that every one of us are called to ministry. It's just where and how. All of us are called to be part of this, this overarching mission of his to, to reconcile all of humanity back to him. It's just when and where. The first checkpoint we need to ask in this question of purpose is, is my purpose to be a part of his mission? Do I see it as a purpose of my life that I am making disciples, that I am coming alongside God in, in this big picture of, of bringing people to know him? That's our first kind of checkpoint, if you will, on purpose. But within this, Jesus actually did um, speak in much more specifics about his purpose. And it would, it would be wise of us to know what he believed his purpose was so that we know ourselves if it is he who lives in us. If it is he who wants to work through us and that he, he is trying to accomplish these things through us even still today. That if my identity is truly in Christ and he is desiring to live in and through me in particular ways, then I need to be aware of what it is he is up to in my life. So we just take a brief tour through some passages here, and I could have a bunch more. I probably have too many here, so I apologize for that. But these are, the, these are some statements Jesus made about his purpose, okay? Or others made about Jesus' purpose. To do the will of the Father to save sinners, to bring light to a dark world, to bear witness to the truth, to destroy Satan and his work, to demonstrate true humility, to preach the gospel, to serve, not be served, to reveal God's love for sinners, 
to call sinners to repent, to seek and save the lost, to bring peace, to bind up broken hearts, to restore human nature to holiness, to satisfy our deepest thirst. Now, I want to be clear what I'm saying here, just so we're no, there's no misunderstanding. I'm not saying that we are God and that we are the ones who are actually doing these things that only God can do. What I am saying is that these are the things Jesus himself says he came to do, and now that he is living through us, it would be wise of us as his church to ask ourselves, how is it that he wants to accomplish these things today through us? To ask ourselves questions like, if, if he wants to do the will of the Father, how is it that he wants to do that through me? That he's asking me to do the will of the Father. What's that mean for me? For my understanding of God's will, for my submission to God, my seeking of what truth is. If he came and wants to save sinners, now how is it that he's asking me to participate with him as he calls people to know him? As he's asking me to take the gospel, to have gospel conversations with people who don't know Jesus. If he wants to bear witness to the truth, how is it that I know truth and can courageously and faithfully speak and stand on truth in a world that is so anti-truth? Or if he wants to demonstrate true humility, and how is it that he calls me to be humble? Something that, if you're like me, is totally against my nature. How then am I to be humble? Or if he wants to bind up the brokenhearted, who's he asking me to care for? Who is it that's around me whose heart is broken that he's asking me to minister to? See, we need to know him, his purposes, so that we know how he wants to live in and through us. We could continue on, but we get the point, right? And this is reflected in a very clear way in the book of Acts. I don't know if you've noticed, but the book of Acts, like the full name of it is the Acts of the Apostles. But yet if you go read the book of Acts, it's very clear in the introduction and then throughout the book that what Luke is communicating to us is that these are actually the Acts of Jesus through the Apostles. That it is them it's their humility, their obedience to him and allowing him to act through them. And our lives should be the exact same way. It's his ministry through our ministry, his life through our life. When we are a faithful disciple, he lives through us. When we tell people about him and his saving work, that's him working through us. We allow him to work through our words through our actions, through our lifestyles, through who we are. This should be reflected in our, our daily priorities, our daily purposes, if you will. That each day we would wake up and we would be handing our day, not having any idea what it might actually hold. Of course, you have a calendar, but that's irrelevant to God. And saying, God, what is it you would do with today? What is it you're asking of me today? Who is it? that I need to speak to? How is it that I need to use my time, my energy, my money, my attention, my talent, my resources today? God, help me to be aware of what it is exactly you want to do today. That my agenda would be yours. Each day, this would be not just this moment on the edge of the bed, but it would be this lifestyle of this consistent conversation with him where we have a meeting or, or whatever it might be. <clears throat> and as we're in that setting, we say, hey, God, what do you have in this? What do I need to be aware of here? You remember my two-year search for purpose, and God responded in, in an unexpected way with me. What I took from that time, I kept asking God to paint this like 50-year picture for me. 
I remember I kept asking, like, God, show me, show me what it'll be for the next 50 years, like how, what my professional life will be, what my family is going to be, because at that time I just had Josiah, just a little guy at that time, like, like, like God, show me what the big picture is going to be. And what I took away is this. God said, Jeff, I'm not giving you the big picture. What I want you to do is just to be faithful with today. To just be faithful with today. That this idea of purpose comes down to this daily faithfulness, this daily walking with him. God does with some folks give like this picture out into the future. And, you know, we all know folks that like um, in, in high school knew exactly what they were going to be. And now they've lived this, this long life doing exactly what they thought, right? We all know those folks. But many folks, there isn't. That we don't know what God is up to in our lives. And he's simply asking us to be faithful with today. He's just saying, hey, Jeff, just today, just be faithful with that. And as we do that, the 50-year plan will take care of itself. Because today I'm going to be faithful. Today, my purpose is going to be to trust and obey God in the little things of life. The small things like I'm walking into a meeting. God, help me. Help me, help me to do this well, to participate in this meeting well, to understand whatever the subject is as you see it, as you understand it. Or dealing with a coworker that's less than fun to interact with. God, help me see them as, they, as you see them, that these interactions would be honoring to you. We respond to our spouse when they're maybe struggling in some trying time in their life. How is it that Jesus would love your spouse? A chance encounter with a stranger you didn't plan on, but boom, it popped up and right there it was. God, tell me what to do here. Or that conversation with your neighbor over the fence. When we say in our vision statement that we're to be the hands and feet of Jesus, this is exactly what we mean. That we would understand that he wants to live through us, even in the smallest of things. And so that we would be attentive to who he is, to what it is that he wants to do in and through our lives. If we do this well, I have discovered God takes care of the big purpose. I spent maybe a year, year and a half, two years, somewhere in there, wrestling with God. It was a dark time. But when this truth became clear and I shifted my focus towards God, what's the 50-year plan, to God, what is the today plan? and being faithful with each moment, and having this sort of moment-by-moment, hour-by-hour conversation with him as the day went, everything completely changed. I found a level of peace, a level of, of joy, a level of understanding of, of my, my, my place in the world in a way I'd never had before. You look up a year, year and a half or so later, I'm in seminary. A place, trust me, I wasn't planning on being. In fact, I remember early in these years of struggling, somebody had suggested to me, hey, Jeff, have you ever thought about ministry? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, right. And I didn't plan it. It wasn't where I was aiming at. But just through daily faithfulness, that's where we ended up. <clears throat> Scripture confirms that this is how Things work that often we have plans God doesn't, and we need to understand and trust and obey his plans. When we look at Proverbs 16, we see the, the writer give this to us in a poetic way that only a Proverbs writer can give. We start in chapter 16, verse 1. It says, The intentions of the heart belong to a man, but the answer of the tongue comes from the Lord. All a person's ways seem right in their own opinion. But the Lord evaluates the motives. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord works everything for its own ends, even the wicked for the day of disaster. The Lord abhors every arrogant person. Rest assured that they will not go unpunished. Through loyal love and truth, iniquity is appeased. Through fearing the Lord, one avoids evil. When a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he even reconciles his enemies to himself. Better to have a little with righteousness 
than have abundant income without justice. A person plans his course, but the Lord directs his steps. In each of these, we get this contrast, right, between our perspective of our purpose and our plans and our priorities and God's perspective. That just like many of you, you know, like my heart had intentions and they seemed right to me. Like whatever plans I had for my life, they seemed good. I had planned out this course and it wasn't until I submitted to him that he directed my steps in a different direction than I had planned, frankly. I remember this sort of process of learning this for myself. Of this idea that, God, I have these plans, I have these desires, but I'm actually going to hold my life out here open-handed and allow you to put in or take out what you will. How scary that was. Yesterday, I attended a a funeral of a a high school classmate's mother. And uh, a group of us that kind of ran together in high school, five or six of us, I guess. Um, A couple of the guys I haven't seen since high school, which was 25 years ago now. And a couple I've kept up with a little bit and, you know, see on Facebook or something, but haven't seen any of them in 10 years. And it struck me as we sat and talked and we're catching up with each other, you know, where you at, you know, your family, those sort of things. How much I've changed since high school. And I thought to myself, praise God. (laughs) Not that I was a horrible person, right? But just praise God that I'm not who I was. I have a long way to go. But I thought about this, that if I hadn't been following Jesus, if I had just been following myself for the last couple decades, where would I be? I'd probably be a lot like I was just further down the road, right? And it's only when we understand our identity, when we understand how then that identity impacts just our daily lives, our daily purposes, that everything clears up. Just to be faithful with today. It's a stewardship of our very lives. In the same way we we steward money one expense or one paycheck at a time, We steward our lives one day, one moment, one decision at a time. And so how is it that we find our purpose? Whether we're talking big picture or smaller micro daily picture. The first is we have to know Jesus. We have to know him as our Lord and Savior so we understand our identity is in him. And then we have to get to know him more and more each day. We have to abide in him, getting to know him through prayer and through his word so that we understand more who he is and therefore who we are in him. It has to be a journey of consistent growth in him so that then as we know him, we can be aware of his presence in our lives. That as we walk into that meeting that has no religious implications, so to speak. It's just this business meeting or whatever it might be that we would sense God's presence even in that place and his leading of us even in that place, that there would be this constant dialogue and conversation with him, that as we meet this person for the first time or or there's somebody sitting near you and you're like, man, I wonder who that is, that God's saying, I don't know, introduce yourself, that there would be this constant conversation of knowing him, that we would be humble enough to allow him to change us. That's incredibly difficult, by the way, humility. It's one of the greatest miracles God ever gives us is the humbling of the human heart, allowing us for our pride to come out of the way and truly allow him to get in and rearrange things from the inside out. He longs for us to know him more. That our hearts would be connected with his more and more deeply. That our hearts would resonate for what his does. We'd have more empathy and compassion and understanding that what what inspires him would inspire us. What grieves him would grieve us. So his heart becomes our heart. And that we'd obey him. 
That as in those little micro moments, those moments of, hey, talk to that person. Hey, this person is actually hurting. Ask them how they're doing and mean it. In those tiny little moments, we would obey him. Because why would he give us bigger things if we're not willing to obey in those tiny little things? That we would obey him. Our, our lives would be this walk of obedience, simply following his lead as through the spirit, he guides us in this direction or that direction. That we would not stop him from living through us, which is our identity, right? That we wouldn't say, I want Jesus, but not to follow him. How short-sighted is that? That our own pride, our own comforts, our own preferences wouldn't get a bigger vote than his will. And in those moments, we would be following him. When we do these things, when we give him our, our lives to even these smallest moments, they add up. The purpose in these small things adding up to the purpose in the big picture being his one of eternal significance, one that he can use, he can direct, he can, he can steer us as his will desires to do his will, his purpose, his ministry of reconciling all back to him. So I want to close with a question, one I actually started with, but I want to come back to it. What do you want to be when you grow up? Some of you, like you're, you're of the age, you're like Jeff. I'm kind of past that. I'm a little grown up, right? No, I'm serious. What do, you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Look five, ten years down the road. Who do you want to be? As you think about who you are, how God has created you, how God has designed you, your situation, whatever that may be in life, when you look down that road and you know that God has created you on purpose, puts you exactly in the places and the people and such as he has on purpose. You know this macro purpose that he has for you of being part of his mission. And you think about what would it look like if I were obedient to him each day? What do I want to be when I grow up? I have this dream for myself that someday I won't be a vocational pastor anymore. I have no idea whether it's retirement or whether it's a second career, but I won't be a pastor anymore. But I will be even deeper in ministry than I am today. Because by taking off some, this wasn't hard in my office. By taking off some of the responsibilities it gives more freedom and time for God to put more in. So I have the time to pour into people, to encourage people in ways I can't today. That someday, whatever church I am in, I would be the biggest cheerleader for that church that God. Whoever the pastor is, I'll be their biggest cheerleader, their biggest supporter. They'll never doubt where I stand. And that I will be a blessing, a gift to those around me, not for me, but for them. Because I've been such an encouragement and a blessing to them. That's who I want to be when I grow up. How about you? What's your purpose? What is it today that you need to be obedient with in your micro purpose to get to your purpose that God has put you here for different than me? Let's pray. Father, will you help us each to simply be faithful with today? 
well up in our hearts a purpose of nothing less than just being faithful. Father, use this as you will. May we hold our lives open to you. What a blessing and honor it is, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name.